Well, that was, ec that was an excellent, Joe, because the, the prelude to what I'm going to talk about, it couldn't have been more, more ideal, the way you worked into it from how goal-directed therapy started, and it really did start with sepsis. And in fact, uh, I read an article uh, as a sideline to researching this, that before Dr. Rivers and Shoemaker did the groundbreaking work that they did, the, the uh, mortality was somewhere in the high 40s, dropped all the way down to the low 20s for sepsis because mm -hmm. of the treatment that they did. It's probably yeah, they a lot have better. a surviving sepsis campaign. Right. It's huge. Mm -hmm. And actually, I think it was higher, it was closer to 60%. Yeah, oh, was it? Mortality and, for and sepsis. If you wow. came to the E, if you were admitted to the ER with a diagnosis of sepsis, 60% mortality. What that was your number. What do you think it is now, in the 20s or less? I, yes, I do. I yeah, think it's that, that's, yes. that's the impact that those mm -hmm. gentlemen had, actually. And part of what I'm going to talk about here is there's a group of about four or five researchers that really started looking into goal directed perfusion, probably in the early 2000, and I'm going to really give a little tribute to them because the impact that they've had on improving perfusion, and it hasn't fully taken hold yet because part of what you just said about the difficulty in us monitoring delivery of oxygen on top of everything else we're doing is kind of holding people back. So hopefully we can make a little progress on that. But the day will come when we monitor delivery of oxygen as a, as a global uh, field, and we're going to see, I think, a big impact. So um, I don't have any disclosures on this lecture, uh, but what was the premise of goal-directed perfusion. Well, originally, and still, still sort of is, is high oxygen delivery during bypass is associated with better renal, better renal outcomes, less ischemic-related complications, and shorter ICU and hospital stays. But what is the best means of achieving it, and how is it determined? Well, what is traditional perfusion? Traditional perfusion techniques gauge adequate perfusion according to body surface area and cardio bypass temperature. This is something we all do every day, right? And has been shown to achieve high DO2 delivery of oxygen in about half of the cases. So I took a little ad hoc survey, Joe, when you called me a few months ago and said, would I do a talk on goal-directed perfusion? And I went around, we have a, a lot of perfusionists that I know and I can talk to, and I asked them, you know, what do you think goal-directed perfusion is? And I got a whole variety of answers, and I don't think I got any of them that were actually correct. I did, actually, I take it back. One gentleman perfusionist that has many years' experience did know exactly what it was. But I was shocked that I wasn't the only one who didn't know exactly how to define it. So some people said, oh, it's AMSEC standards and guidelines. Well, the American Society of uh, AMSEC has created the standards and guidelines based on clinical evidence and currently accepted perfusion practices. And this document is intended to serve as a useful guide for teams developing institution-specific protocols to improve the liability, safety, and effectiveness of their extracorporeal support services. AMSEC recommends that clinical teams use this document basically as a guide for developing their own protocols and for patients receiving escobal support. So the answer is no. Um, goal direct perfusion is not the AMSEC standards and guidelines. Uh, some people said, well, it's evidence-based medicine. It's the same thing. Well, I'm going to come back to this in a minute instead of answering that. Well, what's the generic definition of goal direct perfusion? And these, these are my words, actually, here. It's not something that I read, because if you Google generic definition of goal direct perfusion, I don't think anything comes up. But it's providing the optimal clinical techniques, methods, and pharmaceutical treatments available to ensure adequate delivery of oxygen, but not only that, nutrients and fluid balance to the tissues in a clinical setting whereby the patient is no longer physiological capable of doing so on his own. Well, what is a more specific de definition? Goal directed perfusion during bypass focuses on perfusion techniques that have been verified to achieve a high delivery of oxygen to the tissues with a consequential reduction in various ischemic related complications with a particular focus on reducing acute kidney injury. So, how does goal directed perfusion research studies differ from traditional research? And this is where it starts to become interesting. Traditional research perfusion studies observe a particular clinical or laboratory setting. They collect data and in order to learn or draw conclusions from that information. Well, goal-directed perfusion studies, on the other hand, perform a per specific perfusion strategy in order to achieve a specific target goal and then assess the degree to which they've attained these target goals. We're going to talk about this. So is it evidence-based medicine? Well, an evidence-based practice is any practice that relies on scientific evidence for guidance and decision making. Practices that are not evidence-based may rely on tradition, intuition, and other unapproved methods. So therefore, goal-directed perfusion and evidence-based medicine practices most certainly overlap one another and are, in many ways, closely connected. So 
What are some of the goal-directed perfusion parameters that one can look at if you're going to do a goal-directed study? Hematocrit and hemoglobin, fluid balance and nutrition, electrolyte balance, blood pressure, vascular resistance, both SVR and PVR, blood osmolarity and protein content, oxygen content of the blood, blood flow or cardiac output, arterial venous oxygen sats and the PO2s of each, lactate levels, and most importantly, delivery of oxygen and carbon dioxide production. Well, what is delivery of oxygen? Joe touched on this a little bit. Oxygen delivery is defined as the amount of oxygen delivered to the tissues or capillaries per minute. But how is it determined? Well, it has to be calculated, which Joe also talked about. Delivery of oxygen is the blood flow times the oxygen carrying content of the blood. And of course, that breaks down to blood flow times the oxyhemoglobin portion, which is, makes up 97% of, of the amount, and the dissolved oxygen in the plasma, which makes up about 3% of the amount. And that formula is same thing that Joe was talking about, blood flow times 1.36 times the hemoglobin times the saturation of oxygen, 0.0031 times partial pressure of oxygen, your PO2. So when you look at this, what are the focus points that we can, the parameters that we should focus on as perfusionists? Well, in purple there you see blood flow is something we can control, hemoglobin is something we, we, we monitor, we, we certainly uh, look at and control our arterial saturation, and we certainly control our PaO2. So those are the four variables, but you can actually simplify this because any of us, even doing mod modestly diligent perfusion, should always, shouldn't have to worry too much about our PaO2s being low. We should all be somewhere in the triple digits or higher. Uh, 150 probably be the lowest that most people would run, way higher. And that's going to give you a 99% or really 100% arterial saturation. So to me, those are kind of already a given. And that simplifies it because now, as perfusionists, we can just focus on what is our blood flow and what is our hemoglobin level. And this is what's going to give us a, an adequate delivery of oxygen, okay? So we need to look at delivery of oxygen index, which is we're delivering a certain amount of oxygen per body surface area, right? And of course, that's the same formula divided by BSA. So how much delivery of oxygen index do we provide on bypass? Well, the normal adult rest range is somewhere between 450 and 800. I think, Joe, in your talk, you said something like 500 to 1,000. Uh, millions of oxygen per minute per meter squared. And this can vary because it depends on what the person's hemoglobin is. If you plug in somewhere between 14 and 18 as a hemoglobin, if you're a cardiac index 2.8 to 4.0, maybe even 4.2 on some people, most people's arterial saturation is about 90, 92% with a PO2 of 90. So if you use those various, you're going to get a, a range of somewhere between 450 to 800 for your average person. But on bypass, it's much lower. It's somewhere between 180 and 380. And that's because our hemoglobins are going to be somewhere between 7 and 9. Most of us have cardiac index pump flows calculated between 1.8 and 2.4. Your saturations are 99% or better and PO2s uh, probably 150 or greater. So basically what this means is on bypass, we typically provide only about 35% of the at-rest DO2 that most people receive. And this, of course, is largely due to a lower hemoglobin and lower blood flow index, which I mentioned. So why do we care about delivery of oxygen on bypass? Well, the focus and the real focal point that it all started with is because of the delicate state of renal perfusion. The low PO2 levels in the medulla and the high incidence of acute kidney injury post bypass. This was really the impetus for focusing on how we can improve. So this was a slide that I, uh, from a talk I gave about two months ago here, Joe, when we talked about the renal perfusion. I just wanted to go over why the, the, the kidney is such a big focus when it comes to delivery of oxygen. And there's very uh, small print, I don't expect you to read that, but there's four articles there at the bottom, and I'm taking quotes from each one, so I just want to display them. Somebody can look them up if they want. And these are quotes from four research articles to do with tissue oxygenation. Kidney physiology and function are particularly dependent on O2 supply. This effect is particularly pronounced in the renal medulla where PO2 levels run as low as 10 to 25. That's just amazing. It is not surprising that the kidney might be one of the first organs to be affected by a global reduction in delivery of oxygen. And in the fourth article they quote, in vitro studies have demonstrated that areas of the kidney are prone to ischemic injury in cases of even slight reductions in renal delivery of oxygen. So, Again, this is another slide uh, that I, I, I stole from my own lecture back about two months ago with this, but just to remind here, 
the regional vari variation in tissue oxygenation of the kidney, the high renal blood flow is first directed to the cortex to optimize filtration and reabsorption, basically going through the uh, nephron there, where the PO2 comes in at about 50. When it leaves the nephron, the, the blood flow then is going to perfuse throughout the, through, exits the afferent artery, and then it's going to go to renal, uh, leading to the renal tissues are perfused and leads to poor oxygenation, which is uh, borderline renal tissue hypoxia. This effect is most pronounced in the medulla where PO2 levels are 10 to 25. So this is one reason why, the main reason why, acute kidney injury and delivery of oxygen were so intimately uh, connected and the, and the focal point was so strong when it came to delivery of oxygen. So, John, yeah. I, I, I just want to rem add to this because you taught me this also is go back to that previous mm -hmm. slide. This is what surprised me the most. I'd like you to just quickly elaborate on it. Hypothermia does not help you in this circumstance. Hypothermia and hyperthermia does not change the met metabolic uh, perfusion needs of the kidney. And the reason is, is because all of the blood flow that goes to the kidney goes through the nephron. The nephron must do the work of absorption, filtration, and reabsorption which generates, which costs a lot of ATP. In other words, you cannot go around the nephron and just perfuse the parenchyma tissues. You have to go through the nephron first. This requires an enormous amount of energy, and then it goes on to perfuse the, the, the renal tissues. So you, you, there's no such thing as a luxury perfusion to the kidneys or over-perfusing the kidneys. It's just like a packaging plant, like a package sorting plant. When it comes down the conveyor belt, the faster the more boxes that come down, the faster the sorters have to work. That's the same thing that happens with the kidney. The more blood supply that you plot, that you send down, the more the nephrons have to generate ATP to do the filtration and reabsorption work of the nephron. Mm -hmm. So you can't get away from this uh, where we can just overperfuse the kidney. They're on a borderline of adequate perfusion, and when you can only go less than that, you can't go you can't go and, above that. And again, cooling them down doesn't do doesn't you, change doesn't anything. Do you any good nope. because we have all believed that that was protective. If you, I think it's, life, I, I think it's Perf that. Web 23 when I talk about mm -hmm. delivery of oxygen, I think it's called, this is the slides from that. And I show proof that hypothermia does not preserve uh, reduced metabolism of the kidney and hyperthermia in exercise doesn't eat either. Your kidney's perfusion stays very, very controlled. Constant. Just about, Almost. yep. Almost. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sorry to interrupt you. So how much delivery of oxygen is adequate for bypass? Now I want to, like I said earlier, I want to give a tribute, mm -hmm. just like you did to Shoemaker and Dr. Rivers, uh, Joe, in your talk, to really these early and current pioneers of delivery of oxygen on bypass. Marco Renuzzi in Italy, Philip de Sommer and, and, and J. Trent Magruder here in the States have done an awful lot of work on this. And these aren't the only ones, by the way. A lot of these guys have collaborated together, but between these two, three, they've probably done over 25, 30 papers just on goal-directed perfusion with delivery of oxygen, and we're going to talk about carbon dioxide consumption. So I just wanted to give a tribute to them, and a lot of the papers I'm getting ready to go over are by these gentlemen. So what has their, the goal-directed perfusion research taught us in regarding delivery of oxygen on bypass? So I'm going to go through some of these articles now. So here's a Renuzzi paper back in uh, 2018, pretty recent. They looked at nine institutions, uh, 326 bypass patients, and the purpose was to determine whether a goal-directed perfusion strategy aimed at maintaining oxygen delivery at 280 or greater reduces the incidence of acute kidney injury. Now, part of what you're going to see is a lot of these studies take a different approach. Some do a more uh, higher delivery of oxygen, some do lower. They're really still trying to focus and find where is that key point that we need to be above. So, they had a goal-directed group where the perfusion was uh, greater than 280 and a perfusion strategy group where they just based perfusion like most of us do on body surface area and patient temperature. The goal-directed perfusion group had an AKI reduction of 67% compared to the perfusion strategy group. Magruder and his group did a study, Nader Oxygen Delivery on Bypass in regards to hypotension, and this is back in 2015. They took 170 patients matched with a one-to-one one one propensity matching score, and they wanted to determine what is the absolute lowest delivery of oxygen on bypass that then becomes a risk factor for AKI. They retrospectively analyzed, analyzed 85 patients who developed AKI 
with another 85 control patients who did not. And remember, these patients were matched uh, for the propensity score of one to one. So there are a lot of similarities, no outliers and differences, and they found in these matched patients, 85 who developed AKI and another 85 who did not. They wanted to see what the difference was. And what was the result? Well, in the non-AKI group, 85 patients, they discovered that they received the delivery of oxygen greater than 230 milliliters a minute per meter squared. And the AKI group averaged a delivery of oxygen of only two, 208. The non-AKI group had a mortality rate of 5.9, and the 30-day mortality rate on the AKI group was 35.3%. They found that there exists a threshold, which they believe they saw in this study at about 230, for the de development of AKI in cardiac surgery. De Sommer, one of the guys I mentioned earlier, a study back in 2011, O2 delivery and, and CO2 production, some of the things you talked about, Joe, in regards to acute kidney injury, they looked at 359 cardiac surgery patients, and their purpose was to explore the association between delivery of oxygen on bypass and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide production and how that related, relates to postoperative AKI. A retrospective analysis, multi-center study, 359 patients were analyzed for creatinine levels and, and AKI postoperatively. What did they find? They identified a group with a nadir DO2 of less than 262, okay? And what they found was above this threshold, there was only a 7.4 incidence of AKI stage two. And below this threshold, there was a 23.2% incidence of AKI. And this is a predictive value of 92.5%. Renuzzi, oxygen delivery during bypass and relating to acute uh, renal failure back in 2005, and again, this is why these guys have pioneered this, they've been doing this back from about 2000, now almost 20 years, took 1,048 consecutive cardiac surgery patients, and their purpose was working under the premise that poor oxygenation of the renal medulla, which I was mentioning earlier, during bypass may cause renal injury. They proposed that the detrimental effects may be reduced by increasing oxygen delivery. Okay. Well, they indexed the lowest DO2 on bypass and an incidence of renal failure. They, used a thresh they identified a threshold of 272 uh, for acute renal failure. If you had a delivery of oxygen uh, on bypass greater than uh, 272, you only had a 9% incidence of acute renal failure and a 1.7% mortality rate. If you were below that, you had an acute renal failure incidence two to six fold with an 11% mortality rate. Mm. Mm. Magruder, in a pilot goal-directed uh, goal study initiative, again looking at acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery, took 172 patients with a 1.1 propensity matching score. Their, their purpose, do a goal-directed study to determine if a DO2 of 300 would decrease the incidence of post-operative creatinine levels and AKI. They took 88 control group patients and they perfused them with the delivery of oxygen of two, 240 and they took 88 and did delivery of oxygen of them of 300. The results, their control group had an average creatinine increase of 22% with a post-op AKI rate of 24%, and the goal-directed group increased creatinine was only average 9% with a post-op AKI of 9% only. So where did, all, where did we find all this? Because if you look at the uh, the, the, the papers I just mentioned, some went, looked at a DO2 level as low as 230, and some looked as high as, as 302. So what is the accepted threshold? What should we be doing on bypass? Well, after almost 20 years of research, and most people accept that these two research papers that were done by Renuzzi and Disomer, and they've done more than one, that the threshold is somewhere between 262 and 272. And if you really want to be safe and, and err on the side of caution, Use a 272 uh, delivery oxygen index when you're doing on bypass, and we're going to look at that. Now I want to talk about the carbon dioxide production, which is something you talked about quite a bit, Joe, as well. In the human body, carbon dioxide is formed from the metabolism of carbohydrates, fats, and amino acids, and is the waste product of cellular respiration. The body gets rid of excess CO2 during exhalation, but at rest, with a total volume of 500 milliliters humans exhale, ex exhale approximately 20 milliliters of carbon dioxide per breath, or approximately 240 milliliters per minute at 12 breaths per minute. The carbon dioxide production index 
is the carbon dioxide pr produced per minute divided by the body surface area, right? So if you have the 240, what I just said, and let's just say somebody has a BSA, BSA of 2.0, Normal breathing is going to produce 100 to 120 milliliters per minute per meter squared of carbon dioxide, but on bypass, the normal range is somewhere between 32 and 50 carbon dioxide index. So what has the goal directed perfusion research taught us regarding carbon dioxide production? We talked all about the oxygen delivery. What about carbon dioxide production? Now, there's known predictors of hyperlactemia. And basically, it's defined as lactates above three during bypass. And those known predictors are a carbon dioxide production, VCO2 index, of anything greater than 60. If you're producing more carbon dioxide, greater than 60 milliliters per minute per meter squared, this is a direct predictor that you're producing lactate. Again, on bypass, we should only be producing somewhere between 32 and 50. So above 60 is an indication we're reducing lactate, and we're going to talk about why that is. The respiratory quotient is a, is a production of carbon dioxide divided by the consumption of oxygen, RQ, the respiratory, respiratory quote, quotient. If it is ever greater than 0 0.9, okay, this is going to be an indication of that we're producing lactate, and we're going to talk about these a little further. So what is the respiratory quote, quotient? I stole this slide off another lecture. And basically, I just want to show you that RQ, if you look in the yellow there, it's the volume of carbon dioxide produced divided by the volume of oxygen consumed. So if you want to look at what, where they come up with this number, the next yellow box there says, simplified equation for aerobic respiration of glucose is six molecules produces six molecules. So if you look there, six carbon dioxide molecules are produced for every six molecule, oxygen molecules consumed. So therefore, this reaction equals one. So at the bottom I write there, if any degree of anaerobic respiration occurs, RQ values rise significantly above 1.0. So if we get into anaerobic respiration, this respiratory quotient will go above 1.0. We're going to talk about why that is in a minute. So those are three known predictors of lactate production, meaning we're into uh, anaerobic respiration, anaerobic metabolism. If any of these, two, uh, if any of these things are occurring, okay? So if you look at the bottom, delivery of oxygen compared to carbon dioxide production ratio, this needs to be less than five. And I'll just show you why that is. Let's just say, for example, we're delivering 300 milliliters of a minute uh, a delivery of oxygen and pr we're producing 40. Remember, the normal range is 30 to 50. So if we're in a normal state, we're, producing we're, we're delivering plenty of oxygen, let's just say it's 300, divided by 40, that gives us a ratio of 7.5. So you can see that if your numerator, 300, your delivery of oxygen starts to drop, and you're only delivering, you know, 250, and your carbon dioxide starts to rise, gups to 50, right, you're going to get into that 5. If you get below 5, you're having a lot of carbon dioxide production and very little oxygen delivery. So you want to always keep this above five, and we're gonna see about how, how all these work in a minute. So here these gentlemen again did, did research, and I'm gonna talk about their, their papers where they focus on CO2 production and the effects of it has on acute kidney injury. So in this study back in um, 2011, their purpose was to analyze a, any correlation between oxygen delivery and carbon dioxide production during bypass. Well, their method was a retrospective analysis, 359 patients at two institutions, and they monitored creatinine levels and AKI stage one and two. So what were their results? They identified that there was a specific cutoff value for elevated creatinine and AKI, and the delivery of oxygen cutoff value was 262, we talked about earlier, but the delivery of oxygen versus carbon dioxide ratio had to be greater than 5.3. A minute ago, I, I mentioned 5.0. Some studies have showed 5.0. In this particular study, they found it needed to stay above 5.3. This had a predicted, predicted accuracy of 90%. So what's happening here, Joe, is that since, if you read their articles, they tell you that ideally what they would like to be, have happening here is that we have a probe that we can slap onto our venous line that gives us live lactate levels, continuous reading. We don't have such a device. We need to seek out, and they're seeking out in these studies, what is going to be an immediate predictive indicator that we are going into anaerobic metabolism. And that's what they're, that, that's what they're pinpointing here. And these are the known predictors of generating lactate. And they define hyperlactate lactate is greater than three, as I mentioned before. Okay, so CO2 production greater than 60, respiratory quotient greater than 0 0.9. I demonstrated on that slide that, you know, 
it needs to be uh, no greater than 1.0, but in their research, they actually fine tune it to where 0.9 is actually the cutoff, and delivery of oxygen to, to CO2 production of less than five. So the purpose, because knowing that, they aim to stu this study aimed to identify predictors of hyperlactemia during bypass with a whole series of derived parameters of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So they're looking for more things. They're really digging into the weeds here to see what other parameters of oxygen and carbon dioxide are there out there that can tell us, maybe things can tell us even sooner or faster or more accurately that we're, that we're entering into anaerobic metabolism. And their methods, they took 54 patients, they sampled uh, every so often lactate levels and various derived parameters of delivery of oxygen and consumption of carbon dioxide. And I'm gonna get a little bit deeper into this study. And uh, so they collected, they basically entered the patient's age, gender, weight, body surface area, of course, and cardio bypass time. And at the end of each sampling time, they recorded these variables. Arterial PO2, arterial SAT, arterial PCO2, same thing with the venous, venous PO2, venous SAT, venous CO2, hemoglobin level, lactate level, and sweep, your pump flow rate, and they were measuring the exhale, exhaled carbon dioxide from the oxygen, mm -hmm. the ECO2, using a capnograph. It gets a little complicated with a capnograph because you have to, uh, there's many issues with it. So I'm not gonna go into that exactly because not all of the, uh, unfortunately, not all of the exhaust nowadays comes out of the exhaust port because a lot of oxygeners are vented. But anyway, if you do sample it and you're getting what you feel is accurate, you have to do a calculation to figure out what is actually the, 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 uh, the production of carbon dioxide index. And there's the, the formula. We can talk about it uh, another time. So now these are, using this data, Again, they were trying to find all kinds of other variables of oxygen and carbon dioxide that could be uh, calculated. And they did a whole bunch of things. The AV oxygen content difference, oxygen consumption index, um, delivery of oxygen index, O2 extraction ratio is a little bit different, uh, veno arterial PCO2 differences, delivery of oxygen versus uh, carbon dioxide consumption, and the respiratory quotient. So they did all of these calculations to try to find, was there anything more that they could uh, use as an indicator that we were going into anaerobic metabolism? And here's a study specifically about that by Renuzzi, anaerobic metabolism during bypass, predicted values of carbon dioxide derived parameters. So they found in this same study, there was no correlation between PA, PaO2, SVO2, and cross clamp time and body surface area. There was no correlation. Whatever those numbers were, they were not indicating uh, that we were into uh, producing lactate. And that's surprising because a lot of people rely heavily on the SVO2. Mm -hmm. And it's actually I do. not. I have. Yeah, and it's actually not an indication that you're into anaerobic metabolism. But all of us do that. But there was significant correlation was found between lactate production and cardiopulmonary bypass time. The uh, consumption of carbon dioxide versus the delivery of oxygen, uh, the carbon dioxide produced versus the oxygen delivered, the carbon dioxide produced versus oxygen consumed, and here's what they found. Now, there was 54 patients, so this slide, don't let it be confusing, it's a little confusing, but basically they found that they sampled out of the 54 patients they did, they had 130 samples where the lactate was under three and they had 37 where the lactate was over three and they wanted to see on these indicators, what was the difference? Well, it's part of bypass time for those that were under 49 minutes or less, did not produce, last, produce lactate and those at 69 or greater were. We don't know what the threshold is on bypass time. Carbon dioxide produced 51.4 but less than lactate of three and 82 above. Remember, our cutoff there is greater than 60. So if you had this, this CO2 produced index, VCO2 index of, of above 60, you were producing lactate. And you can see there they, they, they found that. Respiratory quotient, what I mentioned before, the cutoff was 0 0.9. If you, anybody who was in the range of 0 0.77 was not producing lactate. When you got above that average of 1.35 on the samples they took, they were producing lactates greater than three. So these are very good indicators. So here's the delivery of oxygen versus the consumption of cardiac of car carbon dioxide. Remember the 5.0 to 5.3. Here again, if you were in the range of six, you were producing. Um, if you were above above five in the range of six, you were not producing lactate. If you were below five, 4.14 there, you were producing lactate. So these are very good indicators. So now let's look here at the graph that they have. 
So if you look on the left, it's just acute kidney injury, rate of AKI. And on the bottom, it's delivery of oxygen. Remember, we've, just, we, we've concluded that somewhere between 260 to 270 is where you need to be as your absolute cutoff for delivery of oxygen on bypass. And I've drawn a red line there. Now look to the left of the red line. Look at the rate of uh, AKI when you are below a delivery of oxygen of about 270. It's way up in 20, 25, 30%. Look how it suddenly drops all the way down to 5% when you deliver oxygen to your patients at about 270. Look at that drop from 25 down to five. And it stays that way, you know, with some variance along the way. Look at the uh, delivery of oxygen versus carbon dioxide consumption. Remember, this is the 5.0 to 5.3 cutoff. AKI incidence on the left, 25%, 35%. And look at the sudden drop when you get to keeping this ratio at around five, all the way down to 10. And on, as you go along the right, it even drops down to as low as five in some, in some studies. And so look at here, uh, same thing with an additional thing, and I highlighted in yellow there, a little hard to read, but remember, so here's our nadir, uh, nadir delivery of oxygen and AKI stage two. Less than 262, remember our cutoff, 262 to 70? Look at the rate of AKI, 20, 24, as high as 30%. When you deliver a greater, which is in yellow there, greater than 262, drops all the way down somewhere around six to 7%. Our threshold, of delivery of oxygen to, hot, uh, to CO2 consumption, remember I said 5.0 to 5.3. If you're less than 5.3, where you shouldn't be, 20% and thereabout. If you're greater than 5.3, drops down to about 7%. And the final thing is, people always ask, well, is there a nadir hematocrit? Well, they actually, they actually looked at this as well, and if you want to keep a general rule in your mind as to where you should be on pump as a nadir hematocrit, it really matters more the delivery of oxygen, but your nadir hematocrit, if, if you look at it, AKI rate of about 18%. If you're below 23.5% of hematocrit, and if you're above that, it drops down to about half of that. So these early pioneers, Renuzzi, De Sommer, and Magruder, what did they demonstrate? Number one, they demonstrated to us that delivery of oxygen during bypass falls below a critical value, 262 to 72. Organ hypoxia is triggered. This is very clear. They've done over 20 studies, and Joe, every time they did a study, they found the same results. And remember we talked about this in one of the other presentations that something like 70, 80% of all, all research can't be duplicated by somebody else. Well, their, theirs has always been duplicated. Uh, with consequent tissue acidosis leading to an increased production of carbon dioxide, and that this mechanism may be a determinant of impaired postoperative renal function. They demonstrated that in hypoxia or dysoxia, cellular metabolism becomes anaerobic and the ensuing acidosis the result of the production of hydrogen ions within the cells produces carbon dioxide via the carbonic acid buffer system, right? So what's happening is people say, well, if I'm not delivering oxygen and I'm not anaerobically metabolism, how am I producing carbon dioxide? When you go into anaerobic metabolism, you actually produce more carbon dioxide. And this is why, because you're becoming acidotic. And all these, if you look on the left, all these uh, hydrogen ions come into the carbonic acid um, buffer system formula push it over to the right and produce all this carbon dioxide. In fact, they produce an excess carbon dioxide. Okay? Yeah, this is, the pH up. This is, why, this is why that cutoff of greater than 60 of, of, of CO2, what I was saying, is an indication of anaerobic metabolism and, and lactate production because your carbon dioxide is going to actually be higher when you're in anaerobic metabolism because of how powerful this system g goes into motion. What's the third thing that we learned for the, from these gentlemen? They demonstrated that when production of carbon dioxide rises above 60, what I just said. You use consumption. You mean consumption? Consumption, yeah. yeah. You, they always use V for consumption and production. So, In the setting of inadequate delivery of oxygen, that an escalating anaerobic metabolism is occurring and elevated lacto lactate levels will very likely ensue. And number four, they demonstrated that in hypoxia, cellular carbon dioxide production versus oxygen consumed, that's that defined as the respiratory quotient, has a critical threshold level of 0 0.9, and any uh, respiratory quotient greater than that is highly predictive of anaerobic metabolism and elevate lactate levels will ensue. And number five, they demonstrated that the delivery of oxygen to carbon dioxide production ratio, the DO2 versus VCO2, has a critical threshold level of 
less than 5.3, and any value less than that is indicative of an inadequate delivery of oxygen, results in increasing production of carbon dioxide through anaerobic metabolism. And if you want to see an example, let's say we're the happy face there, we're delivering more than enough oxygen, cutoff level is 270, but let's say we're delivering 320, and we're producing a normal level of, of uh, carbon, di carbon dioxide, 40, which is the normal range, look at our ratio, it's eight, well above the 5.3. If we're only delivering 240 of oxygen and our carbon dioxide level production is 60, look, we're down to four. So this is, this is why this ratio makes a lot of sense. So now, Bob Groom did a wonderful uh, research uh, review paper on all of this and quoted all these gentlemen in that paper as well. And I'm gonna go over, this is sort of the final little section of the talk, but I'm gonna go over what, what he did and he talked about in 2017. Well, first thing he did was took a little non-scientific survey of perfusionists in 2017. And he asked them, do you measure venous oxygen saturation levels during bypass? 85% of perfusionists do measure uh, venous oxygen saturation. He also asked, do you routine, routinely measure carbon dioxide production index on bypass? Only 9% of perfusionists measure carbon dioxide production index. He asked, do you routine, routinely measure venous PO2 levels during bypass? 71% of people do measure venous PO2 on bypass. A lot of people don't take a venous blood gas. The last question he asked was, do you routinely measure serum lactate levels during bypass? And 43% of people, perfusionists, do measure serum lactates. So, he, they, at his institution in Maine, they created a care plan that estimates delivery of oxygen based on hematocrit. They enter patient parameters, the procedure, the age, the height, weight, and hematocrit, and then this generates a table that indicates the flow that's needed at various hematocrits to maintain your delivery of oxygen above that 273 critical level, okay? So here's what they, here's the screen off of their, um, their computer at the, and, the, and their hospital. So you don't have to focus on all that, that's all the parameters, but look what it generates highlighted in yellow there. Depending on your hematocrit, it tells you how much pump flow you need to have to keep the 272 delivery of oxygen. If you have wow. a crit of 20, you need an index of 2.8 and flow 5.32 based on this patient's BSA and so on. And they, they calculate it from a crit of 20 over to 28. So if you're at 28% crit, you don't need to flow 5.3, you can flow down as low as 3.88, and you're still delivering that critical threshold of above 272 delivery of oxygen index. So here's a monitor, they have live readings of this. And it's a little hard to read, so I wrote on the right margin there what you're seeing. The top one reading there is 303.94, that's your delivery of oxygen index. Remember the cutoff, 272. So on this patient, they're delivering well above their, their, their threshold for necessary delivery of oxygen. The production of carbon dioxide, remember that should be between 30 and 50, is 45. And their ratio, delivery of oxygen versus consumption of CO2, which needs to be above five, is reading 6.1. So this is a wonderful uh, software program that I think they developed, where they do real-time monitoring of all three of these critical parameters to make sure that they are keeping the patient out of, of any semblance of anaerobic metabolism. And here's another screen that they generate, and I'll just show you the one in yellow there. And it does show you these same things, delivery of oxygen, if you look across the very top, SVO2, delivery of oxygen, the ratio. And if you look, it'll give you a maximum that they reach during the case, and below the yellow is a minimum. But the average shows you there, let's say DO2, they average 294 uh, delivery of oxygen, keeping well above the 272. They, um, that ratio that's supposed to stay above five, look, it's 11.85, okay? So this is a really wonderful uh, thing. So basically, I wanna thank you for listening and I wanna propose some discussion and basically what I wanna say to, to you, know, we talked about this earlier is, okay, all this sounds fine and good, but what can I do with this tomorrow to be a better perfusionist? So since Adequate PA, PaO2 and arterial saturations should be a given. If your PaO2 is above 150, uh, your arterial saturations are going to be essentially 100%. So those two items basically should be a given. So when you're looking at your formula for what you should be easy way to deliver uh, deliver of oxygen index, okay, you can. Um, basically look at your calculation and what you're going to want to know is what do I need to flow if my hemoglobin is six or seven or eight or nine so that's why I've highlighted the hemoglobin there in red and so 
if you look at your d delivery of oxygen uh, um, formula there at, the, at the, the middle one, you know your delivery of oxygen number wants to be 270. So you're going to solve the formula for flow. You want to know what your flow is. So you're just going to solve the formula differently. You're going to plug in, see at the bottom there I have uh, the flow and the hemoglobin in red. If you have a hemoglobin, if you just do these three calculations, we want to know what you're supposed to flow on this patient. And on this particular patient, I assume the BSA of 2.0. And you can use 1.0 for your saturation, 100%. You just put 1.0 into the calculation. And then your PAO, PAO2, you can use whatever you want. It's not going to change things very much because that's a very tiny factor. But just use something like PA2 of 200. And then all you have to do is put in your hemoglobin numbers of 7, 8, and 9. And it'll tell you what you need to flow. For a hemoglobin of 7 on this patient with a BSA of 2.0, you need to flow 5.36 liters. You plug in a hemoglobin of 8, 4.7, and a hemoglobin of 9, 4.23. So what does this tell you? Well, first of all, if your hemoglobin is 6.7, you're probably going to tell the, the physician, I need to add blood, right? And you're going to get yourself back above 7. But you can see that if you're at 6.7 hemoglobin, you might have to increase your flow a little bit. And anywhere in this range, you're going to be fine. If you have a hemoglobin of 7.5, you can still flow the 5.36 and you're going to be overflowing your target of 272. So this is a real quick, easy way of basically just solving the formula, putting in your known delivery of oxygen of 272, you put in your, your body surface area and plug in three different hemoglobin levels, which you're going to run into on bypass almost always, seven to nine. And it'll tell you what your flow rates need to be. So now you're not flowing according to BSA and body temperature anymore. You're flowing according to keeping your threshold of delivery of oxygen above that critical level that we know is so important. So here I show it to you to solve the formula for put 272 in for the delivery of oxygen, whatever your BSA is. And um, you're basically just solving for the formula. I think these slides are extra. So thank you guys for listening. Yep. Thank you. Give myself a hand. Can you, can you do me a favor? Can you go? Can I see your, your yeah. clicker? Um, I want to go back to a slide, uh, David. I want to. Oh, uh, here. It's over here. Uh, click, a lot click, of them. Click, 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 click. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. Right here. That's the slide I want to ask you about. So if you increase your Nader DO2, it makes a difference. If you increase your Nader DO2 and your CO2 production alone makes a difference. Mm -hmm. If you raise your Nader hematocrit on its own, it makes a difference. Did they look at all three combined, optimizing all three of those things? Since that, that slide tells me they looked at one thing, one thing, and one thing. What if they took those patients and they optimized all, th analyzed all three of those simultaneously? I think that's what they do. I think I don't think if you're just gonna just gonna look at delivery of oxygen and try to keep your delivery of oxygen above 270, let's say 272, you are, I would say, with a very high likelihood, gonna be doing an excellent improvement for your patient. But it would be worth it to know you know, if you're, what your production of carbon dioxide is as well, right? Because... So, so what I'm saying is, so I, might, I might not be asking my question well. So let's just use the, the, the first two. So let's say, let's say the Nader DO2, the first one, was, uh, two, was, 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 great, was greater than 262 mLs per minute per meter squared. The, 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 uh, uh, the uh, delivery. The delivery. So your DO2 was greater than an index of 262, which is good. Right. But your hematocrit was less than 23. Well, see, that's why this slide is a little bit of an off, off the mark slide because the whole point is if your hematocrit drops, you increase your flow and you keep your delivery of oxygen up. Right. So the hematocrit alone is not an indication of anything because you can flow more as your hematocrit is low and then when you give blood or concentrate or whatever and bring your hematocrit back up, now you have, you have the ability to flow less. Right. Which is why I just showed that three, three calculation at yes. the end. So just, this is, this is what I see all the time. I'm watching somebody do a case, the hemoglobin is in the sixes, 
hey doctor, can I give two units hemoglobin 6.5? Yeah, yeah, drop in two units. They drop in two units, the hemoglobin goes up, but they never flow, change the flow ever. So in other words, when you had the lower hemoglobin, and now you've dropped in blood and you didn't change your flow, when your hemoglobin was low, maybe you should have had a higher flow mm -hmm. until you got your hemoglobin up. Mm -hmm. That's why targeting a delivery of oxygen keeps you above this level, even in the face of hemodilution, you know, something happening where your hemoglobin is low, you have a small patient, mm -hmm. you, didn't, you, didn't, you couldn't take off volume or something like that. So the hematocrit really becomes uh, your, your, your indicator as to the fact that you need to flow more or less. Yeah. It's not in and of itself, which is why a lot of studies that just say, well, um, AKI, this is a famous thing. We had a hemoglobin below 21 and we had AKI, so we can never have hemoglobin above 21. Well, you could have if you had flown more to deliver the oxygen. It has nothing to do with the, mm -hmm. with, with the hemoglobin. I remember, you know, all of you guys went to THI, I did too. We wouldn't, we, we wouldn't give blood. <laughs> not me. Not you? No. Well, we'll go there one day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we didn't give blood if the hemoglobin was five. It had to be. It, had to be, it was it, crazy. It had to be below five. And uh, you didn't flow enough. You know, probably didn't. But, yeah. um, you know, if you. If like you, Shumway, 30, 30, and 30. And I'll tell you, if oh, you want to wanna really open discussion to something, I presented almost 15 papers on adequate perfusion, and not one of them looked at blood pressure. Do you realize that? They didn't even look at it. It's not part of the delivery of oxygen formula. And people focus so much on giving vasoconstrictor on bypass, keeping your blood pressure up, and reducing acute kidney injury, which uh, reducing acute kidney injury had to do with almost every single one of these studies. They don't even mention blood pressure, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. right? But how many times have I said it? I've said it, I say it all the time. You, you say, thanks, bud. Um, I say it all the time. Good pressure is not is not uh 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 what's well, how do i want to say is not a yeah it's not a uh, no it's not exclusive oh. to good perfusion right mm -hmm. you can have a great pressure and lousy perfusion as is evidenced by i won't say this was many years ago what do you do when you have given more neo than you intended and the blood pressure is going to skyrocket because your SVR is going to skyrocket because your blood vessels are all going to constrict, mm -hmm. but you just have to fix it. There's no point in making everybody else in the room upset. What do you do? The famous trick, lower the flow. You lower the flow <laughs> right. and Go up turn your vaporizer up all the way. <laughs> so you still have a blood pressure of 70, not 170 but you don't have good perfusion at all. If you've ever mixed your neo syringe uh, double strength because you figured, uh, well, I, instead of giving you know, half a cc, I can give a quarter of a cc, <laughs> and you kind of overdid it and your blood pressure skyrocketed and you turned your flow down to almost nothing yeah. and you still had a pressure of 90 yes. and you turned your vaporizer right. to five and you still sat there for a minute or two before it started to come down, you know exactly that your yes. blood pressure is indicating. Yes. Ver now, I had a friend, I'm asking for a friend. Yeah, right. I yeah. was asking <laughs> yeah. for a friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, now, we say this every time when the blood pressure conversation comes up. You can't run a zero or a 10 or some ridiculously low blood pressure. Why? You have to maintain capillary integrity. The blood pressure, as long as you're maintaining your capillaries open and you're not collapsing your capillaries, then blood flow is going to go. Do I know what that number is? Do any of us know what that number is? It's probably patient dependent. You know, um, I don't know. Uh, there is exactly. A, I think there is a, a. I think there is a doctor. Remember Dr. Garani? He talked about that. Um, your capillary opening pressure, and I, it's somewhere in the. It's somewhere in the fifty range, isn't it? There's. I, I don't remember. You know. To he, maintain capillaries it, open, yeah. and it may be the 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 because when he was doing the TCD, yeah. he was talking. About, now maybe it's. Maybe it does depend on the patient, but I, I, I don't think it's 50 seems a little bit high because Probably, people yeah. have perfused their brain with a 40 certainly right, before. Right. But uh, yeah, I don't know what that is. It might be 30. I don't know. Yeah, it might. It probably. It I need probably Dr. Karami to come back. I worked at a place not too long ago where they kept the pressure on bypass was 35 to 49, never yeah. above that.
Well, I told you. And, and, and they never, I never had any, I never had even a problem with AKI because I asked them. And, that's uh, what they say. That's what they said. Come I, on. I, I mean, do you have any? I mean, well, it was. A, it Everybody was, does the, it was, the toughest cases, and their mortality is the lowest. Give me yeah. a break. Well, um, they've that. been doing it for they they've been doing that for about twenty five years at this mm -hmm. place. But and it's yeah. a busy it's a busy place. Oh well, yeah, but if you have but, a if you have a seven percent renal failure rate mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. you know predictable two and a half to one and a half to two and a half percent three percent mortality for whatever i mean that's acceptable mm -hmm. a stroke rate of seven and a half percent that's acceptable but is that really acceptable that's the whole point is what do we find to be acceptable is seven percent stroke rate a seven percent renal failure rate 25 percent renal well, rate, 15 percent right. renal failure rate is that really acceptable it's only acceptable because everybody else is doing it Right. right. That's what people measure right. it by. Right. Well, and that's else, a horrible... I guess it must be okay. Right. Yeah. So we're not doing any... Right. right. Exactly. Right. Right. So, it, you know, John has talked about DO2, mm -hmm. and, and Joe picked up on the DO2 after all the conversations they've had during all these talks. It's interesting that, you know, it's just coming to light now. I mean, I saw it a, a few years back, and, you know, this goal-directed perfusion is a great thing. I think, and don't quote me on this, Levanova is doing something with their electronic medical uh, records. Connect. With Connect, and it has to do with DO2. So it's making its way into the into the. That's actually what I was going to bring up. Into the into that world as well. So it's it's one of their um, nice little markers to and a selling point for EMR. Oh, sorry. Well, it's, it's interesting. As it's a, very interesting. Right. As we're moving into where we're going to have to have electronic charting, I mean, that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. That is something that I've seen in the presentations um, from uh, Soren, uh, yes. Denico, whatever, yes. Livanova, yes. whatever. Yes. Sorry, can't keep up. Yes. Their Connect system, mm -hmm. as well as some of the other ones out there. And mm -hmm. they're trying to make that, uh, you know, there's all kinds of as parameters. But that, that's one in particular they are all focusing on. Yeah, it's it, it is based on I believe that Renucci study, and it's it, and it actually will show up on your screen on your EMR. It it will flash something on your screen and say like, hey, you're below your threshold, which was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's again nothing that I had you know when I was starting out, but you know it's it's a great paper. These are great papers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and AKI. It's a, it's a big deal. So it is do. a big deal, and I think that we, I said this earlier when we, uh, uh, before we left, I think what we accept is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Yeah. I think, you know, we're all so paranoid about blood transfusions. We are. And I think right, rightfully so. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a liquid tissue transplantation right mm -hmm. right we all agree with that and there are consequences Absolutely. to giving transfusions but there's real consequences to anemia real consequences to having i think a uh, hemoglobin on pump of six i've heard of it many times right you know i talked about shumway does do you all know what shum we all know what shumway was right we all know who he was right from stanford oh. shumway Back in the old days, he's one of the the Cooley, DeBakey, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the, the the godfathers of of cardiac surgery. Um, and thirty, thirty, thirty is a flow of thirty cc's per kilo, a pressure of thirty, and a uh, temperature of thirty. Mm -hmm. So that's thirty, thirty, thirty. That's how he did all of his cases, mm. and people survived. Now, you now, know. Now all the data. <laughs> There's more data. People survive. <laughs> right. People survive. Mm -hmm. So people can survive a lot. Well, it doesn't I, mean they're not getting an insult. Well, it also doesn't mean that those patients that didn't make it, that they wrote off for some other reason, would not have possibly made it. Maybe some of them. Maybe none of them. I really don't know. Intuitively, however, I think that if you can reduce AKI rates by 1%, by changing something that we do every day when we work, I think that has impact. 
to that 1%. Absolutely. Well, Does, sure. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but we don't. I think your point of what we find or other people find or institutions find acceptable is unacceptable. What is the acceptable rate that of people suffering an insult or or dying that is acceptable if we can change something about it? And that should be zero. That's exactly mm. my yes. <laughs> right. That right. is what I have been thinking. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. The goal should be zero. Zero mortality. Unrealistic. It's but that not still achievable, but that goal. should be yeah. the goal. It shouldn't be zero percent less than right. eight, seven or eight, twenty or whatever acute it renal is. Failure. Zero percent stroke. But so what we have come to accept mm -hmm. That was my whole point. Yeah. Is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I can tell you a funny story. In the, um, in the 80s, long before I was uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, when I was still in my undergrad years, um, went to work at the hospital part time just being a phlebotomist. And you had to have your hepatitis B uh, vaccination shots up to date. So um, back then, it, there was no uh, artificial um, laboratory derived. Uh, uh, vaccination for hepatitis B. It had to be derived from people yes. who had hepatitis I B. Had to have well, it. that was right yes. around the big HIV craze was coming out. So I had my first shot. I think you had to wait six weeks later and get your second one. You're supposed to get a third one. Mm -hmm. well, right about the time of the second one, the, the department put a paper out on the, on, the, on the bulletin board that I think it was 0.7% or something like that of all people getting the hepatitis B vaccination were coming down with HIV. Oh. But it was 0.7%. And I remember somebody saying, well, that's pretty low. And somebody else said, but if you're one of the 0.7%, that's 100% for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is if we have a 7% AKI and a 4% stroke rate, well, that's 100% that's, that's if it happens to you. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it doesn't matter that it's 7% and that's what everybody else is doing. Right. There's still a lot of people mm -hmm. that are being devastated by whatever that is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you think that there's, you know, two, what, 200,000 hearts done now, or 200, yeah, it's 280, it's either mm -hmm. 180,000 or no, 200. It's, it's been 200 000. something for a long time. Yeah, it? somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah. No, I think it's 180,000. Is that yeah. much? It's gone down quite a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, back in the day, I mean, I remember a time when it was over 700,000 mm -hmm. right. cabbages a year. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. It's down to about, a, it's under 200,000 a year now in the United States. Mm -hmm. That's still, but you know, that's still a lot when you start talking about 7%. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Now some, I understand are unavoidable, but I think we should try, we as clinicians, should do our level best to reduce that number for us, you know, and our patients. We can't do a whole lot for somebody else's patients. And I think these discussions can help, but this is an individual, this is a practice technique. What matters to you? Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, they uh, are happy with what they're doing. I'm not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we can do better. Is no, that, I, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. On the few rare occasions where I actually do a case. <laughs> you, did you did a case, case yesterday. yesterday. I know I did. Yeah, you're good for another six months. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, uh, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, back in 2015, I went to work at a place, and I won't mention the guy's name, but the guy was an excellent perfusionist. He was 15, 20 years, and you know, he, he was just excellent. I learned a lot from him. And I watched, I go in there and watch him do a case and he's behind the pump and he's pacing. And I said, you know, so-and-so, I won't tell his name, but why don't you sit down and relax? No, no, no. And I always wonder, why, why is he on the edge of his seat? He's so nervous. Everything's going perfect. He just, everything he does was excellent. And, and I, after a while, I asked him, I said, you know, so-and-so, I said, w w why are you so, you know, nervous behind the pump? He says, I'll never forget what he said. He says, I try to run the perfect case every day. And he didn't even care if it was within his control right. or not. If the surgeon so much as reached back and made a comment about something, to him that was an imperfect case. Right. And he had it in his mind that he wanted to run the perfect case every day. And I just thought that was so interesting because what you just said a minute ago, Joe, is we kind of go in every day and we, we're comfortable with what we're doing and so we do it. And, uh, and he just stood out to me that, that it didn't matter that he'd been doing this as long as he had. It didn't matter that he really knew 
about as much as you could probably you know know and do and he was still like just paranoid and, and dedicated to somehow doing everything perfect every day which mm -hmm. is a big big task because you can't do it you know that's right mm -hmm. but i think you have to try yeah we have to Absolutely. try so um i've got a comment here uh from franklin odari uh discussion around metabolic acidosis and safe use of bicarb in view of striving for adequate perfusion while meeting the surgeon's dynamic flow requests causing stages of tissue hypoperfusion, underperfusion, and uh, hyper or luxurious perfusion on bypass. So you want to talk about that? Let's talk about bicarb. What do we all think about bicarb? It's not a substitute for good perfusion. Oh, no, it's but by it's, no means. It's certainly, uh, so, you know, so Franklin, um, I think, you know, uh, Dordell, go ahead. I'm a big proponent of it. I give a lot. You do? I do. Um, because, you know, we're, we're using Del Nido. We're, we're, it's, we have anaerobic metabolism going on. So I, I don't know what it is. Where? It, it, the heart? With, with Del Nido because it's anaerobic. It's, it, there's, there's lack of the blood substitute in the, in the cardioplegia. You're saying because it, of the because five to one more, ratio? Yeah, it, it's more. It's a. It's Instead a one of four to four. To one, it's, or yeah, however you yeah. want it. It's, it's, it's more. It's a one to four. There's more crystalloid yeah. than there is blood. blood. Whereas, right. I understood that, but so I, I have less that, of a buffer with 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 uh, with the crystalloid. Hmm. So, so how do you blood. know you're having myocardial anaerobic? Because if you take the cross clamp off, you see a spike. I, I don't your, see a your... spike, but you remember, I don't know. There's a, there was a study back in the '80s about talking about myocardial pH mm. and how low it is mm. in an ischemic um, in an ischemic state. Mm. So when you take that cross clamp off, if I create a little more of a metabolic alkalosis, I can maybe counteract some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Kind of yeah. like how, you know, you get leg ischemia from, you know, what is it, the impella mm -hmm. or something like that or, or mm -hmm. a large catheter up mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a release of, 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 you know, some nasty stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you maybe pre-treat it or, or do something like that. Yeah, I wouldn't think, I mean, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. I mean, I'm, but my heart's come back. My heart's come back. A yeah, they nicer. come back. I mean, I would. I mean, I, yeah, I guess there's probably some. I mean, I guess I imagine there would be. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't. Know. It's a good question. I would think we'd need to measure, um, put a coronary sinus catheter in, and upon release of the cross clamp reperfusion, mm -hmm. measure the lactate level. Oh, there's the there's studies that have done that. Yeah. There's when they, we you we know. came out with the well, not we but when they came out with a coronary sinus you know, retrograde perfusion, people were doing that. They were mm -hmm. like, leave it in, let's take a sample. And the, the blood is, is pretty deleterious the first mm -hmm. 30 seconds or so. Wow. And one thing's very important, you mentioned acidosis. And I was doing this research as I talk about lactates in almost every one of these studies. One thing people need to not forget is that the cells and the tissues detest ac acidosis. Mm -hmm. They do not function well, they will do everything they can to not be acidotic, and so anything we can do, uh, cellular function, enzyme function, everything becomes dysfunctional and even the modest amount of acidosis on a cellular level. Really? Yeah, and that's why, if you ever notice, if you have a patient's metabolic, metabolically alkalotic, you ever, we had one the other day uh, in the unit, uh, 7.57 and, and CO2 was low. It was just a metabolic al alkalosis. And I don't think that's very well understood. In fact, we had top physicians doing grand rounds and I asked one of them, I said, do we, f do we understand why this patient would be in metabolic alkalosis? And he looked at me and said, nope. I said, you're not gonna do anything about it, right? I mean, you're not gonna give the patient acid. Yeah. And, I, and I said, acid based product, are you? He said, nope. Well, but when a patient's acidotic, and he, I mean even below 735 or even that range, the cells, if you look at the studies, do not want, that's why we have so much buffer systems in the body. We have so many buffer systems in the body to prevent acidosis, right? And so, you know, it's important that um, we don't allow our patients to get acidotic. And then if they do, um, I'm not sure, was this question focusing on deleterious effects of giving bicarb? Yeah, so is there, is there any yeah. downside to bicarb administration? Is it, is it you know? So, so I think two, two parts to the question, I'm gonna to try to interpret it, but so the first one is, you know, 
just basically dealing with metabolic acidosis. I think you answered that in saying that acidosis is, is bad. bad. Mm-hmm. The cells just de- detest it. So giving bicarb in that case is, you know, appropriate. And you mm-hmm. give bicarb uh, uh, generously yeah. and you're not concerned about it. Metabolic al- alkalosis is not the issue, but dealing with the cause, the root mm-hmm. cause of the acidosis, which is the surgeon is saying, you got to turn your flow down. Mm-hmm. I can't see, the heart's too full, whatever it is, uh, dealing with that and treating the subsequent Result. acidosis secondary to hypoperfusion mm-hmm. is that how does that marry together does that benefit or does it not benefit because the acidosis of course if we, sh- we shift our oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve to the left vis-a-vis you're gonna you're going to uh, uh, release more oxygen more quickly to the tissue mm-hmm. so you improve tissue oxygenation in acidosis with hypoperfusion, so if you correct it, you then hoping? you're going to go the other direction. Of course. And you make the affinity for oxygen, the hemoglobin have a higher affinity for oxygen. You don't release it as readily. So there's our dilemma now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But rarely do I flow underneath like two liters. Right. Or two, excuse me, a cardiac index of two. I mean, if yeah. you look at all right, my but charts. are you delivering? Uh, above 262 milliliters of uh, index of 262? Above 272. <laughs> 272. Oh, so you already <laughs> yeah, yeah. did the math. I never I go below 272. I always do it. But I think that's Over great that we, very close I mean, to. I've already learned something that I can, that I can take mm-hmm. with me on this right. on today. Mm-hmm. And that's, I, I, I don't, we, I have not measured DO2 routinely and I don't know why. You know, is there an app, and I should have researched in my research, yeah. there ought to be an there app where all you have to do is there plug be, in the BSA, there right. be that's going to stay magic. the same. And then all you have to do now is hit Where's hemoglobin magic? and get a DO2 and hemoglobin, because that's, that's the right. variable left, left, right? Because right. you know your, you know you your know PO2 is going to be a decent amount. And yeah. it's, only, yeah. it's only 3% of the equation anyway. And, and your PO2 is going to stay good. Your saturation, put in 1.0, 100% for simplicity, or 0.99 if you want. And all you have to do is say hemoglobin 7, what's my DO2? And, and get four or five of them. And you know right there, you know, without having a fancy machine that right. hooked right. up to your, you know what I mean? Because these guys have shown that if you can keep above these three parameters, you're not going to be producing any uh, lactic lactate or anaerobic metabolism almost anywhere in the mm-hmm. body. And mm-hmm. I always found it interesting. Well, the body doesn't like lactate either. Yeah. Well, that's Especially the, the lungs. Yeah. 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 Lungs hate it. You know what's to me funny about perfusion is Is there this, an app? That's what we want to know. Is there an app? Is there just. Oh, he doesn't know. The question like. was <laughs> is there an app to easily measure DO2? DO2. There will be. There will be. Excellent. You guys can make one. So don't don't you ever think to yourself, you're sitting behind a pump and you've got this everything going on and your cure line goes up onto the table and basically disappears behind the PA. You can, sure. And basically it disappears and you basically sit back and hope that on a micro level, on, on a regional level, that the body's just going to be perfused perfectly everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not what's happening. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why if you're monitoring, there could be regional areas of anaerobic metabolism. Mm-hmm. There could mm-hmm. be micro areas, there could be macro, there could be places being overfused, unperfused. And so without n- lo- monitoring some of these things, you're just saying, oh, my venous blood gas is coming back, great. As you can see, the SVO2 was not really an indicator. Right. Of and I think so mm-hmm. for, for our routine coronaries, that's generally not that big of a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think in, our, in the ICU setting, which we spend a lot of time in, do we even think about capillary bridges like we used to we used to think about you probably learned that in school right how you know perfusion deficits that are occurring at the microcapillary level where you have this perfusion um uh, defect that occurs and you can actually see where the flow is they do it with these sublingual uh, i told you about those before these 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 things you can look in at the microcirculation under the tongue and actually see instead of the flow going through you can see it sl- sludging and stagnating mm-hmm. and not flowing properly in a very hyperdynamic cardiac environment they're septic and their hearts just pounding and their blood pressures tanked and all these things are happening and you think their cardiac output is 20 mm-hmm. but at the capillary level it's barely moving it's not working right and so i think those are kind of you know that's where these things i think really apply i think for our routine coronaries it's probably fairly uncommon 
you know, unless you have some kind of, you know, problem with the position of the cannula or something like that to have a regional, a regional deficit. Although I don't know, you know, we have pulsatile flow. You talk to uh, Dr. Cohn at Texas Heart and he'll tell you, uh, uh, you know, you know we, we capillaries are, are, are continuous perfusion, continuous flow. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of patients out there walking around with uh, with uh, uh, ventricular assist devices or artificial hearts that are continuous flow. So mm -hmm. do you really need a pulse? Well, well, I think we have to talk about it a little bit differently. When you go on pump and you cool a little bit, even if it's down to 34, 35, or if you still go down to 28 or 30, mm -hmm. when you cool, you're gonna have uh, vasoconstriction of the capillaries and shunting is gonna happen. How many times have you been rewarming or watched somebody rewarm <laughs> and their SVO2s drop? Mm -hmm. And the perfusion will say to you, well, of course it's dropping, my metabolism's picking up it's not gonna pick up that much that no. fast. What's happening is you're rewarming yeah. and all these clamp down capillaries that have begun tissue poor perfusion are now opening up and mm -hmm. you're getting a dump. Yep. Mm -hmm. That should tell you if you're rewarming and your stats were 80 when you were 20, you know, 30 degrees and now they're you know, 68 because you're up three or four degrees higher. You're having an opening of the capillaries that were constricted because you cooled or maybe gave them the O2 and now they're opening and that acidotic blood and desaturated blood is now coming back into the system. Hmm. That's what rewarming is showing you. And you are having some increase in metabolism. But, you know, to me, you're also increasing your flow, right? We have a 1.8 at low yeah. and 2.2 and 2.4. So you're telling me that the metabolism went up, but I see that you've turned your flow up too. But yet your SRT is still a lot lower than it was. Mm -hmm. So I, mm -hmm. I think when you see that, you have to think to yourself, wow, when I was cold, even if you weren't monitoring all these things, you sh it's showing you, the body's telling you, I was not really getting a lot of, you know, there was regions of tissue that weren't getting perfused while you were at mm -hmm. that colder temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, well, let's go around the table and get some get some final thoughts. I think we're actually, we're, we're, we're over time we're to over make time. up for yesterday. That's okay, we gotta make up for yesterday. Yeah, we sure. gotta make, so we're going to start over here. Rodell, final thoughts for the, for the day. I, I really think, I mean, this, this simplified, you know, flow calculation is, is excellent. I mean, that is absolutely great. I think every, everybody should calculate everybody this. Everybody should be calculating. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I always flow at a, you know, 2.4, you know, that kind, kind of thing. And I do, uh, you know, a small calculation and I, I will come down every once in a while but uh, yeah I think we should do this every single case mm -hmm. or just find or just find a, a simple hemoglobin like seven eight and nine mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. it's it's really easy it's right. really easy and I can explain to the to my surgeon hey dr. so-and-so I am flowing at my 272 mls I am getting this guy or gal the correct flow so we don't have this right. Mm -hmm. I can't get down any further. I'm at the, I'm at yeah. the threshold. Mm -hmm. I'm at the threshold that yes. below this is going to create problems. Yeah, move your can cannula. you not just <laughs> can you not just yeah. you know can you see can, can you, you see can you deal with this? Yeah, can you deal with this or hey maybe you have to reposition your cannula because I need to flow this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have concrete evidence to say like hey I need to do this, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you need to help me with my cannula mm -hmm. or I need to do this. This mm -hmm. is what's going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If your surgeon's evidence-based, you can really argue that well. You know, oh, yeah. Now it's and outside. we have a couple. Yeah, no, that's good. They're only evidence-based until they can't see. <laughs> yeah, then again, the exactly. yeah. it all goes out the window. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I would comment back on the bicarb, giving bicarb. I would, I would come down on the side that if you were having acidosis, um, you need two things. You need to treat it because you need to get the tissues out of acidosis. Then you need to find out why. why you know, you have, you're band-aiding. You're, you're, it's a band-aid to give bicarb because sure. whatever's causing it, probably still causing it. So I would be in favor of giving bicarb, getting yourself out of the acidotic uh, range and getting the tissues and, and cells more happy, yeah. functioning well, and then see why you're, why you're causing acidosis, yeah. see if you can fix yeah. that. Yeah, mm -hmm. get, get out of the eight ball. You, know. you do have to get, be concerned, yeah. obviously, with a lot of get bicarb, but sodium yeah. will go up. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, uh, mm -hmm. but that's a different issue. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Barasina? Well, I think these talks have been really interesting because I'll admit, I haven't thought as much about the kidney as I should have. <laughs> and I've had a lot of kidney education in the past yeah. three or four months. I and I wonder that. how many other people really are thinking about that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, just with your Neo talk mm -hmm. alone. Yeah. Um, so focused on one particular thing. And did I have urine at the end of the case? That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all the kidney that you thought about. Mm -hmm. 
I've right. always said that I think the kidney is one of the most underappreciated organs mm -hmm. in cardiac surgery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. said that many times. And it's and, and, and it's something that I, I'm sort of into it, you know, because yeah. I've you know got the CRRT thing going mm -hmm. and this and that, whatever. But, you know, I've been looking at this in the organ crosstalk, John, you talked about that. Yeah. All of these things, um, you know, I think that, uh, you know, are, are kind of touched on in school. Yeah, a little but bit. But we forget about them, you know. Well, when you and get out into practice. Right. Wh wh what do you have to do right. that? You've given us something right. to kind of look at for that. But when you get out there, what do you have? Participating yeah. more in these kinds of programs, everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Getting involved, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. You know, we all need to get involved. That's what I'm trying, yeah. That's my, my, my message for the day is, what? Oh, flow is king. Oh, Joe Greco <laughs> says flow, flow is, is king. king. Flow is king. <laughs> flow is king. Joe, you're right. Why didn't you call in though? Why didn't you just pick up the phone and call? Look, I got the phone, it's right here. Uh, the number's up on the screen, 347-694-4400. Yeah. If you call within the next five minutes, <laughs> you will receive a perf web. There. No, you do it. You should. Thank you, excellent. Thank you, man. That was excellent. That's awesome. Okay, so, uh, or send me an email, let me know. Let me know if you'd like to get involved, Joe. You and also uh, Franklin and uh, Mohana and who else is on here? Er Erickson, come on, guys, get involved. Give me a, send me an email. Do whatever you want to do. All right. I, tomorrow we're going to be. We have Doctor Samir Hani Samir is going to come back. Can you put the schedule? Oh, here I got it right here. Um, and he's going to be talking about the optimal vent settings for resting the lungs affected by ARDS. Mm -hmm. We're, and that's gonna be really good. And then John is gonna be giving us a talk. I, I went out to Orlando and visited John at his hospital and I, 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 he sh showed me around his 18 ECMO patients. And I was like, I saw this one and I was like, what in the, I, just look, dude, what the hell is going on in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen this before. And so we came up with this talk when VV, VV ECMO is still not enough. Wow. And that's going to be a great, I'm looking wow. forward to hearing this. Because I, I already, I already sure. know the story, but I want to hear how you, how you break this down. So uh, Dr. Samir, and speaking of bicarbonate acidosis, we were talking about that lactate levels. La the lungs hate it. You mm -hmm. leave your lactate level mm -hmm. elevated, 10, 11 like that, you're going into ARDS. Mm -hmm. Guaranteed. So your, your, your hyperlactatemia can be caused by something else, but that lactatemia is going to result in you going into ARDS and needing to be on ECMO. So you have mm -hmm. got to treat that. You can't just leave that. Mm. That's a major, major problem. And bicarb does not fix nope. like hyperlactatemia. Mm -mm. You've got to clear the lactate. Mm -hmm. And that's why Z buffs, C B C R R T, mm -hmm. yep. uh, better perfusion, fixing the underlying perfusion deficit mm -hmm. is so critically important. And it's easily cleared with dialysis and CRRT. Mm -hmm. Lactate's a very small molecule, it comes out quickly. Mm -hmm. Very easy to deal with. Okay. So we'll see you all tomorrow and thank you all very much.